Hello, my name is Lewis, and I'm coming to you with the Sunday School lesson for August 26. And this lesson is entitled Practicing Justice. And we'll be coming from Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 17. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walk sometime when ye lived in them. But now you also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any. Even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Amen. So, I show the, the phone just to, to give props to Bible Gateway. This is where I get the, the readings from. So I take no credit for the reading. This is obviously not me. It's a King James Version by Paul Mims. And that is available on Bible Gateway. I just didn't want uh, any problems with anything like that. Anyway, so we're coming from the book of Colossians, which is not really a book. We just say book because we're so used to saying books. But uh, it's a letter that Paul wrote while he was in a, in a prison cell. And while he was in prison, he wrote a couple of, uh, couple of letters to different churches. And one of them was to the church of Colossians. And his intention was not only to get the letter to the Colossians, but also to the Laodiceans nearby. And um, there's something that is written in my Bible that I wanted to share as far as the as far as the the purpose of the book is concerned and i think it goes in in line with today's lesson and it it kind of um puts in better words than i i could probably do so i'm gonna just read read right midway from their um from my bibles i think this is like a forward for the actual book of colossians but uh, i'm gonna read midway to the like the second to last sentence it says, Paul's purpose is to show that Christ is preeminent, first and foremost in everything, and the Christian's life should reflect that priority, because believers are rooted in Him, alive in Him, hidden in Him, and complete in Him. It is utterly inconsistent for them to live life without Him, clothed in His love, with his peace ruling in their hearts, they are equipped to make Christ first in every area of life. I think that was perfectly sum uh, summarized in in that uh, whatever that is a forward it is like a forward in my Bible for the letter of Colossians. But um, so we see. Colossians chapter 3 and the key verse is verse 12. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, 
humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. And the lesson, again, is called practicing justice. And when I first read this lesson's title and read the lesson, I was really, to be very honest with you, I, I didn't put the two together. But bringing Sunday school lessons in the past about the word justice where justice means equality and fairness and, you know, right way of behaving with one another. And so it's equity. It's, it's um, living at peace with other people, fairly with other people. But more, more, more than anything, it's how the church should behave towards other church folk and even the people in the world. And so when... Other church folk, when they interact with other church folk, it should be a given that we are to act this way. But when we interact with the world, it's not a given. It should be remarkable. It should be stand out. We should, we should stand out among the world as, as to why are they behaving this way? Why are they so good and so nice? Why are they, you know caring about anything why do they care about this more than i do <laughs> and so it, it should be a remarkable difference between us and the world because we were once a part of the world and now we have we have um have been extracted from the world or taken out from among the world even though we're still in the world follow me track me even though we're still in the world, we're not of the world. We're not with them anymore. We don't run with the old crowd. We don't do the things that we used to do, uh, even though uh, you know some of those things are still remembered in our flesh. We still remember, but we, we now have been delivered from those memories and delivered from those past behaviors so that we have a new taste. And a new taste is because we have a new, a new way of living, and that's because we live in Christ. So let me go, um, go ahead and get started. And so you you see that it started out. And you know, chapter one is all about Jesus Christ revealing the Christ, you know, the head of the church. Uh, also, another thing that the forward brings out in my Bible is that Paul wrote both Ephesians and Colossians, and when you notice that in Ephesians, Ephesians talks about the church of Christ. Uh, you know, the church, the, the body of Christ. But in this book, it's talking about the head of the church. So it's, it's similar in, in, um, in Avenue, like the way that Paul was coming at them uh, with the idea of a body, the body of Christ or the head of, of the church. That kind of idea is still in both epistles. Epistles is another word for letter. And so we begin at verse 5 where it says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon earth. Then it has a semicolon there. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Now... You can say among all these things, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, that they are all which is idolatry. Or you can say that the very last part of that scripture is covetousness, which is idolatry. Now, any one of these things can be taken as idolatry because you are putting your selfish desires pretty much your your fleshly desires before God because you are not your own anymore remember in for uh, first chronic uh, chronicles first corinthians paul actually says you you are the your body is the temple of the holy ghost you are no longer your own you have been bought with a price therefore glorify God in your body and so being that we are the temple of the holy ghost we don't belong to ourselves anymore. We have, we have now been freed from where we did belong to. And now we have a new master. The master we had before 
caused us to do all kinds of wrong in this world through our body. And so that's another thing that's in this scripture. Mortify therefore your members, your members. Now look at yourself, pat yourself on your shoulder or on your chest and say, my members. Mortify therefore my members which are upon the earth. Now, what does he mean by this? When you, when you read in context what's going on here, he doesn't say your arm. You know, members of, if you have members on your body, that's your arm, that's your head, that's your nose, that's any member of the body. And we understand that, that, that language, that form of thinking. Or a member of an organization. You know, that member over there, Brother Paul, Brother brother Peter, Sister Magdalene. You know, all these people are members of one organization. But it's not saying that. It's actually saying mortify, kill, destroy, starve it out, make sure it's dead, mortify. Therefore, your members, my members which are upon the earth. Now, how are my members upon the earth doing these things after the semicolon? My members were given to these things, to fornication, to uncleanness, which is moral impurity, inordinate affection, talking about your passions, like sexual and sexual passions and, and monetary passions, you know, things that... May you make you greedy, make you lustful, you know, those kind of things, those inordinate effects. Even homosexuality can be thrown into that mix. And evil concupiscence. What did I have for evil concupiscence? Uh, actually, they're very, all of these are very closely related. That's why I said that they all can possibly be funneled into this idea, which is idolatry. They all can be funneled in that because... They all deal with a desire that is birthed from the body, from the flesh, from a carnal disposition. And so when he says, mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Well, what's upon the earth? We live on the earth in our bodies. And so the members of our bodies that, the, that Paul is referring to are the actions of our bodies. So those are the extensions of ourselves. And so now our behavior and our action is our members of our body, which is an extension of ourselves in this world. Now, how do I know this? Where do I get this idea from? Look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. 1 John chapter 2. Verse 16. Um, it says, For all that is in the world, then it, said, then it explains, John explains himself what's in the world. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And so, these lust, they come from somewhere. They don't just appear out of nowhere, but lust is a, a inward passion or desire on the inside of a person that can only be seen when it is acted upon. And so when we do have lust of the flesh, it is manifest in our body, in our members, in this earth. And so the only way these lusts or these passions, these desires can be manifest is by us hashing it out, acting it out, behaving it out. And so the lust of the flesh is clearly seen by the behavior that we exhibit. The lust of the eye is clearly seen or felt within ourselves by our own behavior. We know what we're looking at. Pride of life is something that we have on the inside. And if we're really honest with ourselves, we can, we can actually pinpoint it 
and see where it is and where it manifests. It manifests in our thinking. Sometimes we think we're better than other people. And so that's not something that is, uh, com you know, commonly associated with something physical like sex or sexual sins. That's something you, uh, you go in the secret place or maybe not so secret, but you, uh, most people try to keep their sin secret if they consider it sin. And those things are manifestly behaved or apparent. Whereas uh, something like, um, excuse me, pride of life, that's not so manifest, but it's manifest. It becomes manifest in the way we talk. Um, you know, it's not, I hope I'm not losing nobody. I don't want to dwell too long on this, but it's not like, you know, I'm stealing something and that's manifest. There once was $10 on a table, but now $10 is gone. That's because... $10 was taken without nobody nobody's permission by me. That means I stole $10 and that's a manifest sin. But my desire for that $10 was so strong that I gave in and took that $10 that I did not pay for. And when I do that, I break God's law. And when I break God's law, I, I in myself, I think I'm above to some degree above the law that I can do that. And so at the very end of it all, which is idolatry, because God says thou shalt not steal. And you chose in your, in yourself to take $10 because you felt the urge in yourself to take it. So I didn't want to go too far <laughs> in that. And so I want to also clarify something as well that it says mortified therefore, meaning that there was more that more to be said in that particular uh, letter. Colossians chapter three, the first couple of verses. I'm not trying to find Colossians. Chapter three. So it talks about Verse 1, it says, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. Not on things on the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Why? Because, uh, um, because we don't belong here. We are in the world, but we're not of the world. And so we are now to be set apart from the world so that we can win those that are in the world yet still into the fold, into Christ. Now, what position are we in as far as Paul is concerned here? We're risen with Christ, meaning Christ, when he rose from the dead over 2,000 years ago, we too, because of our faith in Christ, are risen with him. We are right now. Now, it, now faith is, what was the scripture in uh, Hebrews chapter 11? Um, let me get that real quick. Because... <laughs> I feel like I'm going to destroy the, the translation. I don't remember scriptures like that. So I got to go to the, to the actual. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Now faith. And so because we have a now faith. Uh, as opposed to the faith that they had in the past. Waiting for Christ. We have a faith that has already uh, obtained Christ. Christ has already done the things that he needed to do. In this, in this earth so that he can have preeminence. But now we're looking back at that, that event of what he did and say, and say with, with Paul that because Christ is risen, so are we with him, risen with him. And so it says, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things where uh, seek those things which be, are above where Christ is on the right hand of God. So, positionally speaking, we are no longer right here. Uh, we, by faith, are no longer 
just right here. Yes, we are here physically on this earth, but we are spiritually in Christ. And so verse three says, for you are dead. You are dead is referring to the old man, referring to the flesh, the corpse that you are living in right now. That's going to die. It will not go with you to heaven. You're going to receive a new body, a new tabernacle. And so it says you are dead and your life, your life, your actual life, your, your soul's life, your soul right now is hid in Christ, right? What does it say? Hid with Christ in God. So we're with Christ, but Christ, as you can plainly see, was taken up into glory from Acts chapter chapter 1. Remember, Luke chapter 20, I forget, 22, Acts chapter 1 refers to Christ having been received up into glory, meaning he was taken up from the disciples and went into the heavens. And so Christ is no longer on earth. He is now up in heaven. And so where Christ is now is where we are spiritually speaking. And so for ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Then when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, shall appear where? Appear here. When he appears, according to Thessalonians, appear on the scene, meaning he's going to appear in the sky. When he appears in the sky, then we're going to see him and we're going to appear with him in glory. And so it's no longer going to be, oh, we're with him spiritually. No, we're going to be with him in glory in the sky as he takes us up. Therefore, Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Flee from idolatry. Don't do this. Get rid of all of that. Mortify it. Kill it dead. If it starts moving, beat it down. Okay, let's move on. So verse 6 says, For which things? Which things? The things that were mentioned in verse 5. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. And so as opposed to the children of obedience, which means that in Christ are the obedient ones. Now, this is this is going to fly in the face of a lot of doctrines that says once you are in Christ, once you are saved, you're always saved and you can disobey from here on. And but you are right because you believed and now you're saved. Ah, uh, no, you stop. No, when you are in Christ, that does not mean that you have carte blanche, you know, the ability to write yourself a sin, sin check and check and do all kinds of sin. And the, the blood of Jesus will be poured upon you and you'll be forgiven because you are still operating in sin. No, you got to stop. You must repent. You must turn away from that thing. This life is for real. While we're living in this shell of a human being, this flesh, we have to mortify the deeds of this flesh. And so that, that, that shows us that there's a difference between the children of disobedience and the children of obedience. The children of disobedience will suffer wrath, but the children of obedience will not suffer wrath. They will not suffer at all. They will see Jesus Christ in glory. This is all, you know, in this, in this letter. Verse 7. In the which you also walked some time when you lived in them. So it's just going back and saying that there was a time when you were not in Christ, that you were living according to your bodily desires in this world, in your flesh, outside of Christ, out, not with Christ and outside of God, meaning you are not reconciled to God at one point. But now, because of Christ, you have been reconciled. You're with Christ 
in God. So verse 8, uh, let me lo also look at something. Um, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. I'm not sure what, what, I, what I had there, but let's read it. 2 Corinthians 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And so that just that's just Paul uh, and me reiterating what has already been said. We were sometimes, we, we did live in that sometimes, and now we don't live there no more. We are new in Christ Jesus. Verse 8 says, but now you also put off all these. And so on top of these things, which were in verse 5, on top of that, he's saying now put off all these. Put off is referring to you still being in your flesh and you still exhibiting behaviors through your flesh. Therefore, you got to mortify the behavior of the flesh mortify fornication, uncleanness, all those things, but also put off these things. Did he say did he say it was wrong to be in the flesh behaving good? No. You can be in the flesh behaving good, but your flesh is not used to that. And because you are now in Christ, there is going to be a war. There's going to be a war in the mind and, and a war for control over the body. And so the war in the mind is between the carnal man and the spiritual man. And the carnal man wants access and control to your body so that your carnal desires can be meted out. Your carnal desires can be fleshed out. And so these things are exhibited through your flesh. Your carnal man, your old man wants control and will try to control your mind to do that. But your spiritual man, which is powered by the Holy Ghost, which is powered by the Christ in you, the mind of Christ, he is helping you. He is your comforter now. He is now with you so that he can assist you in living right and living holy. And putting off these things. And so he wants you to live right and do good. But he's talking about what, what to put off. Put off also these things. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another. Why? Seeing that, the, that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. And so... When it talks about your members, it's talking about your old man exhibiting itself through the flesh. So your old man is the old you before Christ, which still rises on occasion if you don't keep it under subjection. If you don't pray, if you don't fast, if you don't read your word, if you don't praise God, if you don't go to church, if you don't put your, your holiness in action, if you don't live right among men, if you're just carrying on doing wrong and you continue doing wrong, you're not going to be built up in that. You're going to be built up by the old man and your old man is going to overcome you and start to... Uh, and start to hash out all kinds of flesh, fleshly desires, and it will be exhibited. And so this is a very serious thing. Your old man wants to exhibit. And so it says, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. So when you put off these things, these things, as I mentioned uh, in verse 5, these things are your desires, your passions. But also verse 8 talks about like emotions. You know, anger is an emotion. Is, it ang is, is anger wrong? Well, what kind of anger? I think what Paul is talking about is anger as in, as in you know, venge vengeful anger. Or, you know, lashing out on people kind of anger. 
It says, be ye angry and sin not. So it's okay to be angry. That's, in, that's found in Ephesians. Uh, wrath, you know, wrath is what it is. Who, who has the, the, the authority to have wrath and vengeance? Only God. We, we noticed that in last week's lesson. As a matter of fact, let me pull that out real quick. You know, some of these lessons kind of uh, hold hands. And it says, uh, yeah, Romans chapter 12, verse 19 is dearly beloved. Avenge not yourself, but rather give place unto wrath. Give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, save the Lord. And so these are some of the things that you got to put off. You can't take matters into your own hand and be wrathful and vengeful. That's God's territory. Put it in the hands of God. Let him deal with that. And so put off those things. Um, verse 10. Mm, oh, man. There was another thing. Look at, if, uh, again, Colossians chapter 3, verse 2. Just going back and forth for a second here. Colossians chapter 3, verse 2 says, Set your affections on things above, not on things in the earth. You have put off the old man. Oh, verse 3. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ and God. The old man is dead. That does not mean the old man cannot resurrect. Just like uh, when we die, we will be resurrected. Uh, right now, it's a, a complete reversal. It's the opposite. Uh, our old man has died spiritually. And now we are strong in Christ spiritually. And we're alive. And so we're considered alive. Therefore, you know, because uh, our new creature, a new man is considered alive. The old man is considered dead. Does that mean that the old man is dead forever? The de old man is dead so long as you mortify the deeds of the flesh and then come to the point where Jesus takes you out of here and saves you once and for all, once and for finally and forever. And so... You know, but while we're living in this husk of flesh, the, uh, the opportunity can come up because we might revisit some things. We might revisit memories. Those things may, may grab us. Uh, we, may, we may be weak at one point in our, in our walk and we may be enticed. And so... Because we're enticed is because we're we've we've succumbed to our flesh, and that's just what James says. Also talking about our flesh. Matter of fact, maybe I should get that. I was thinking about it, but maybe I should. Let's see, Let's see if I can find it. Ver chapter one, verse twelve. It says, "Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life." which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And so you see the, you see the, the progression of what's going on. If you have lust, it's because you are your your old man is alive and kicking and you have not done your due diligence to murder that old man, kill it dead, mortify the deeds of the flesh. And now the things are rising up in you and now you feel that that quickening of the old man in your bad behavior. And so that's something to, t um, to look at. Verse 10, verse 10, yes. Verse 10, it says, And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Again, you can see that new, that new creature, new man idea in 2 Corinthians 5.17, uh, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. And so, Jesus Christ has given has given us the opportunity to be reconciled to the father in himself but what he has done is that he has now created in us 
a new creature which is the which is made after the image of him that created us and that's just that goes to certain goes to show that we have been uh reestablished as a, as God's creation as God's uh crowning achievement and crowning uh creation uh, crown, crowning creative achievement of being made in his image and in his likeness whereas when Adam and Eve fell in the garden they they their image was marred and so they were no longer like God or made you know in his image um, the memory of where they come from will always be there. We can always say of humanity that God, that humanity has been made in God's image and his likeness. But truthfully speaking, every man that is born in this world is a few days full of trouble. Uh, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is no one righteous, no, not one. All of humanity born into this world has been born with a defect. And because you have a defect, you don't look like God. You don't act like God. You're you're not even inclined to behave like God. It's called the moral. It's called depravity. It's called the Adamic nature. And because you have the Adamic nature, you don't have God's nature. That's why Jesus came on the scene and gave you His nature. When He died on that cross, he gave up the ghost. And then uh, was resurrected, and fifty, day, 50 uh, days later, was it fifty days? Yeah, fifty day, Pentecost, the day of Pentecost, when they had come, they received God's Spirit. But before Jesus left the earth, He said, He breathed on them and said to them, "Receive ye the Holy Ghost." But they didn't receive it then; they received it during the day of Pentecost. And that was that was just a foreshadow. What Jesus did was that he was to, was actually foreshadowing something that God was going to do to them on the day of Pentecost. Breathe on them so that they can be inspired and filled with the pneuma of God, the pneuma hagion, the Holy Ghost. And so when they received the Holy Ghost, they received the Spirit of Christ in them. Now, Romans chapter 8 talks about that same spirit. Matter of fact, I don't want to all... Again, I don't want to misquote it. Look at Romans chapter... I think it's chapter 8, verse 9. Romans chapter 8, verse 9 says, But it, you are not in the flesh. You are not in the flesh. This is the same thing in today's lesson. We uh, as far as our life in Christ is concerned, we are not in the flesh. Our real selves is not in this flesh. I hope you're tracking me. I, I, I don't mean to lose anybody if that, that confuses anybody. But our real selves is not in the flesh. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now he calls it the Spirit of God. This is Paul. And now he says, Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Making it out that the Spirit of Christ and the Spirit of God is one and the same Spirit. It is the same Spirit. Matter of fact, Romans chapter... If I'm not mistaken, Romans chapter 12 talks about the, the idea of the same Spirit. Let's see, baby. Same spirit, same spirit. Ha! Same office. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was something like that. So, um, talking about the the. It's talking about the the gifts. And the ministries and everything, but it says it in here specifically about the spirit. Same spirit. Now I can't find it. That's not right. That's a to every man as long not to think of some more highly than he ought to think. Not to 
Mr. Sleepy now, why? Uh, I'm not going to find it right now. Anyway, in one of the discussions, of, I think it's about... I think it's about the um, about the gifts and the ministries and the things in the in the church. He says it is the same spirit that works through it all. I think I may may have been on the wrong. Yeah, let me not let me not. Uh, I don't want to rear too far off. So again, let's go to now. The, uh, the knowledge after the image of him that created him. Um, look at Acts chapter 17, verses 26 through 28. This is going to go in line with verse 10, 11, and yeah, verses 10 and 11. Look at Acts chapter 17. Verse 26. It says, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord if haply they might feel after him, feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of our own poets have said, for we are all, for we are also his offspring. And so when we read verse 10 and 11, and having put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him, after his image, uh, again, it says right there, we, for we are all also his offspring. Verse 11 says, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free. Uh, in Acts 17, verse 26, and it hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell. And so all these nations of men have now been compiled and, and a few here and a few there, but all of the ones that were extracted from all the nations of men have now become one in one body. And so in this body, there is no di differentiations as far as Greek or Jew. We don't operate that way. Black, white. We don't operate that way. Uh, you know, circumcision or uncircumcision. We don't do that no more. We don't classify people like that no more. Barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free. We don't make those kind of uh, variations in the body of Christ. We are all equal in the body of Christ. Therefore, justice, equality, fairness in the body is going to be meted out through our behavior towards one another. And so how we behave in our flesh is going to dictate uh, dictate where we're at in our walk with him. And so it says, um, so because of that, that, I th that idea, in him we live and move and have our being, um, all the old way of thinking is out the door. Even Jesus, when it when it when he was teaching about uh, dominion, he says the world exercises dominion in such and such a way, where they go to war and and trounce on each other and take things and pillage and rob, break things, kill people, all for dominion. But the kingdom of God, we don't do that no more. We don't do that like that no, uh, you know, in the kingdom. All of our dominion is now forwarded to the one who can take dominion himself, and that's Jesus Christ. He has taken dominion, and now he has forwarded that dominion to us because he has taken it. Not because we uh, rose up in war with one another on this earth to take some kind of control over something. We don't exercise dominion that way. We don't exercise our flesh the way we used to exercise it anymore. And so now we're we're a new creature. Verse 12 says, which is the key verse, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved. Now the elect of God is the ecclesia, the the called out, the, the you know the the marked ones. We have been marked out from among the world. 
we're no longer counted with the world. And so put on, therefore, as the elect of God, what else is the elect of God? Holy and beloved. Now, what does he say? Put on bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. And then it says, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And so what he's in essence saying that is that the that everything that you have ever been forgiven for, you should be so easily forgiving, forgiving of other people that do it to you. And so if you as a thief, if you were a liar, if you were a cheater, if you did all these things, even if you didn't do it, you were not, you were not, um, you were not perfect. You somewhere down the line did something wrong. You should be easily forgiving. And so this is the behavior that you put on. You put off those other things, verse five and verse and verse um, verse eight, right? You put off those things. You take that off. It's like you have clo dirty clothes on your body, and you say, "Oh my God, this is filthy." Take it off, because you're no longer filthy. Take it off. Now what you put on is brand new stuff, clean stuff, washed stuff. You know, bounty. You know, tied, arm and hammer, washed, clean stuff, full of the fuller soap. It says, and above all these things, now on top of all these things that you're putting on, above all these things, put on charity, which is just another way of saying love, which is the bond of perfect perfectness. Bond in this in this all. In this context means to bind together. Kind of like glue. Love is the glue that puts all of this stuff together for you. Uh, matter of fact, when you go into uh, Galatians and you talk about the, the fruit of the Spirit. The, the first thing it talks about is love. And because love is first, it holds everything else in place. So love is the linchpin. Love is the very thing that holds and, and puts all these things in works. It's because of love you can forbear one another. Let me just go down the list. It's because of love that you put on your bowels of mercies, that you are merciful. It's because of love that you are kind. It's because of love that you humble yourself. You have a, hum uh, a humble mind. You are meek. You are long-suffering. You forbear one another. You, you long suffer with them. Uh, what else here? Uh, for, you forgive them. And if any man have a quarrel against any, you forgive. All these quarrels, these bickerings, these fightings, these, these uh, so-called you know, fights that people have within the body of Christ, that should not be named among us. We, because of our love, because of that charity, that, that above all thing, thing, you know, you, you should be able to overcome that. And so verse 15 says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also you are called in one body and be ye thankful. And so what's ruling in your heart? The peace of God. God rules in your heart. But if you don't have if you don't have peace and you're doing and you're putting on these old things it goes back to that which is idolatry you don't make god the ruler of your heart when you are now allowing your body to dictate to you what you ought to do in this world which is sin no you cannot do that anymore you put off those things Verse 16 is, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now, I, I pose the question, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Well, why? 
Why let the word of Christ dwell in us? Very simply, why? He is the Christ is the word of God manifest in flesh. Again, I always point back to this event in history, in, in biblical history, that when Jesus was baptized, you know, in the Jordan by John the Baptist, that when he came straightway out of the water, the heavens opened up and a dove descended upon Jesus. And a voice came from heaven and says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. When you have, when you let the word of Christ dwell in you, it means that you have heard Christ and you are hearing him, you know, actively hearing him and doing the things that he says to do. Being obedient, not a child of disobedience, but a child, but a child of obedience. Hearing the words of Christ and performing those things. All of Christ's doctrines should be ready in our heart to be performed. Put off the old way and put on the new way. Put off all the old members and put on your new members. And your new members is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Verse 17, we're going to try to end this real quick. And whatsoever you do in word or in or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Why do we do all things in the name of Jesus? Because the Father has spoken from heaven and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He has given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. It is authority in the name. Why that name? Because that name expresses who God is in our earth. He has become our salvation. He is right now manifest. God has manifest in Christ. And so when we have Christ's words dwelling in us richly in all wisdom and knowledge, we, we are now, in essence, actively hearing the word of God and being obedient and following his ways. We are being discipled. We are being, you know, conditioned in a new way, whereas we have to be weaned off the world and conditioned in a new and better way. And so we give thanks to God and the Father by him. Now, it says God and the Father. Now, does that make God and the Father or God God, and the Father two separate persons? Absolutely not. God and the Father is one person. And that one person is only contacted, only connected with, only by the name of Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is the very... The hand of God reached down from heaven to make contact with us. Um, this is the only way we have access to God, by faith in Christ Jesus. If you don't believe in Christ Jesus, then you ain't never going to touch God. You ain't never going to see God. Because to see, to see God is to see Jesus. To believe God is to believe Jesus. If you don't believe Jesus, then you don't believe God. And what was that? Matter of fact, let me get that real quick. And then I'm going to just, let's see how much time I got. Uh, I believe, what's that? Ver, John chapter 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I would have told you. Jesus spoke. And would have told us, hear ye Jesus, hear ye him, the son of God, which is the word of God manifest in flesh. The word of God, according to John chapter one, verse one, is God himself. It says, in, uh, it says in, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Now, we already un uh, understand by Colossians that being with Christ is to be in God. 
And so when Jesus said this while he was yet alive, he was saying something that Paul grasped wonderfully and beautifully and put it together in Colossians. To be with Christ is to be in God. It says, I go and prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Which, which is amazing because when you see the progression of this conversation, Philip comes in and says, Lord, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. And Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. How sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. But the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Or else believe me for the very works sake. And so, to be with Christ is to be in God, according to Colossians, today's lesson. And so, today's lesson was practicing justice. Now, I know I kind of went on left field at the, towards the end there, but... Um, at the very same time, these are ver these are things that we ought to know uh, how to behave in this world. Jesus Christ came in this world and behaved in such a way that he was pleasing to God. Now, because we are in Christ. See, Christ already did the work. Christ already pleased the Father. Now, because we're in Christ, hidden inside of him, we please the Father. Ain't that something? So we ought to be practicing this justice in our flesh, mortifying the members, getting rid of the old and putting on the new. I hope you guys got something out of this lesson. This was a wonderful and very needed lesson in this, this day and age. We, we're living in the end times and the love of many will wax cold and will not behave like Christ uh, coming towards the end. I hope that you make that change in your life to behave like Christ and practice justice. God bless you all and enjoy.